Welcome, welcome everyone, and welcome back from spring break for those of you who uh, took off for, for a week. We're great to have you back here at Boston University, and, and this is my first uh, live event here at BU, and so it's great to, to be here with all of you in person, and also uh, great to be engaging with all those of you in, in the world of social media and YouTube, where you'll also have a chance to, to see what we've been talking about today. This is uh, one of the, long, uh, the, the latest in the Beyond the Headlines series that we have here at the Party School. And today we're discussing vaccine diplomacy. Uh, and it happens to be around the second anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we're here to discuss the efficacy of vaccine diplomacy, which uh, Ambassador Storella defines as the competition, and I would add, and sometimes cooperation, uh, among various countries to use vaccine donations for influence or prestige. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm a professor here in the Party School, and I direct something called the Global Development Policy Center. We're down at 53 Bay State Road. Our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and the environment. We've been working on this issue a little bit uh, uh, with respect to the interrelationship between international trade rules and vaccine diplomacy. And, but more so in our group on the economic response to the, uh, to the COVID crisis. But today we're really just talking about the vaccine diplomacy story. Let me introduce our two guests. Uh, I'll put this in context. The three of us will have a short conversation and get your, convers your questions ready because we want to have a dialogue with each of you. And uh, so we can all get to know each other when we, when we start that. Uh, please introduce yourself, tell us. Uh, what your program is and, and, and who you are so we can so we can get to know each other in this in this intimate setting. So I'm really happy to have Dr. Nahid Medelia and Ambassador Mark C. Storella here with me. Let me introduce you to these very uh, incredible people that we can have a great conversation with. Dr. Medelia is an infectious disease physician, associate professor here at Boston University School of Medicine, and the founding director of the BU Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases for Policy and Research. She's a member of the WHO, World Health Organization, Technical Advisory Group on Universal Healthcare and Preparedness Review, uh, examining global readiness against emerging infectious diseases. She's additionally a visiting fellow on pandemic preparedness at the White House Office of Science and Technology. She's been a frontline medical provider during multiple Ebola outbreaks in West and East Africa with WHO and also Partners in Health. And she's led global programs on healthcare response to highly communicable diseases. For the past decade before, she served as the medical director of Special Pathogens Unit, a patient care unit backing up BU's Maximum Containment Laboratory, participating in regional, national, and international biosafety and biosecurity response task forces. Her own research focuses on global health security and evaluation of medical countermeasures, diagnostics, and natural history of emerging infectious diseases. We're excited to have Dr. Bedelli with us today. We also have Ambassador Mark C. Storella. He's a professor of practice of diplomacy here at the Party School of Global Studies. Prior to joining Pardee, Storella served for over three decades as a U.S. Foreign Service Officer. He was U.S. Ambassador to Zambia, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration, and Dean of the State Department's Leadership School. He is the recipient of several State Department awards, as well as the CDC's Excellence in Service Award and the American Citizens Abroad Thomas Jefferson Award. Here at Party, if you haven't taken any of his classes yet, he teaches about American foreign policy, diplomacy statecraft, global health diplomacy, and humanitarian affairs. Let me just give us a, a little bit of context, and I'll uh, ask each of the panelists a couple questions. As I said, we can have a little bit of a conversation between ourselves, get things going, and then engage with the rest of you. As I said, when I kick this off, we just passed the two-year anniversary uh, when the WHO announced the pandemic. I think it was March 11th, the folks that are entirely experts. And something that's fascinating is that in just months later, thanks in part to upwards of about $100 billion in government support, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna uh, created the first vaccination. And the first vaccination was in December of 2020. Uh, at that moment, there was a tremendous amount of hope across the world about ending the pandemic with a global vaccination drive. Indeed, in 2021 alone, more than 11 billion vaccines were produced, enough to vaccinate every adult in the world twice with some left over. 
Unfortunately, as of 11 of March of 2022, less than 10% of people in low-income countries have been fully vaccinated, compared to 73% in high-income countries. Advanced economies largely cornered the market, hoarding many times more the doses than their need, and ultimately undermining the effort to equitably distribute uh, doses through COVAX, the vaccine pillar that I'm sure we'll talk about, and they also blocked efforts at the World Trade Organization to help countries produce their own vaccine since we weren't transferring them to others. Meanwhile, richer countries here in the, as here in the United States are now removing our domestic COVID-19 restrictions, ostensibly urging people to get back to normal, while more than 6,000 people globally continue to die every day, and that scene is an underestimate. The Economist magazine sees it upwards of maybe four times more than that are still dying on a daily basis. The International Chamber of Commerce estimates that the economic cost of inaction has cost the world economy about $9.2 trillion. Uh, so that's, uh, that's as large as the economy of, of California. As a result of all this anguish, the International Monetary Fund put out an alert that more than 60 countries who stretch their budgets to protect their people and service their international debts during the crisis uh, may face a de debt crisis due to a rise in interest rates in the United States. This was their warning to the world in February of 2022. Well, this week, the United States stands to raise those interest rates on top of soaring oil prices, soaring grain prices, all due to the Russian invasion, and that will only accentuate this distress. It's not all bad news. Just yesterday, there was a breakthrough in the negotiations over something that we'll probably talk about called a TRIPS waiver. Developing countries said, if you're not going to help us with gain access to these vaccines, we want to produce them themselves. The United States was uh, was been in favor of this, but some European and other major pharmaceutical producers have, uh, have really blocked it, and there was a breakthrough yesterday uh, that we may see the light on that. Uh, so we'll, these are the kinds of topics that we'll be talking about. I wanted to sort of frame it a little bit. And my first question is to both of you, and I'll start with Dr. Bedelia. Uh, has vaccine diplomacy, defined again as the competition among various countries to use vaccine donations for influence and prestige, help address these global needs? And if so, how? If not, why? Yeah, Kevin, thanks for that. You know, I, I think that we have to step back and talk about why SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is such a threat to the world, right? It's because on its first appearance, and right now that seems to be potentially end of November 2019, um, I'm sorry, 20, yep, 2019, the, the trouble was none of us had any immunity to it, which means that a virus like that, that hasn't been around, that our bodies have not seen, can wreak havoc. And so the infection mortality rate, or infection fatality rate, seems to be much higher. So our goal was to basically de increase all of our immunity, right? And that's what we've done, kicking and screaming over the last two years through vaccines, through infections, through, um, and through all the work that we've done is to increase the baseline immunity in the global community. But the reason we do that is because we've seen what happens when you are able to get those vaccines to people who need them. Look at the numbers here in the US, even with our numbers, which are I think 65% or so uh, in, in having one dose you are looking at a disconnect between the infections as well as hospitalizations and deaths. And that matters, infections matter, we can talk about it another time. But the reason that disconnect matters is that that allows with the, the infections to continue without overwhelming the healthcare systems. And so what's happened over the last year, the goal of you know trying to get the vaccines out to as many places as possible has been to shield particularly healthcare systems that don't, you know, if our healthcare system was overwhelmed, imagine the impact that this has had on healthcare systems that at baseline are stretched, that at baseline have maybe one physician for 100,000, maybe you know 10 community health workers for 100,000. Add to that the burden of this of the new infections that you're seeing. We have not been able to accomplish what we set out to do, which was to rapidly increase the immunity. And what we did over the last two years is because we didn't get vaccines to as much of the world as we wanted to, we actually just left the left the rest of the world to get to that immunity through infection rather than through vaccination. So we failed in that way because the world did have to go through that you know, increased level of cases, every surge, and then 
have that side effect of having healthcare systems that are overwhelmed. The other thing that I'll say is that a lot of this, so why did we, um, I'm sure Ambassador Sir Sterling will talk about this in a second, but why was COVAX created, this utility, this partnership with CEPI, with WHO, so CEPI's Coalition for Epidemic Prevention and Innovation is an international organization that was formed in the aftermath of the West African Ebola epidemic to really help push forward new tools, right? Um, vaccines that can help with emerging pathogens. The, the reason COVAX was created is because in the last global pandemic, in H1N1, it was years before you know, low and middle income countries had access to vaccines. Um, and so the goal was to create this combined purchasing power to be able to say, you know, a certain percentage of low income populations will be able to both access and afford uh, vaccines to get us closer to that global immunity. And so we, we're, we're closer now to getting that global immunity, partly because more vaccines are available, but partly because we left the rest of the world to suffer through the surges. And the infection immunity does provide some amount of protection. Maybe it's not as powerful, uh, potentially, in terms of the quantity of antibodies or potentially lasting long enough as that from the vaccines. But we've, we've failed in the fact that the rest of, most of the rest of the world, particularly in low-income countries, end up going through it by infection. Ambassador, uh, has the vaccine diplomacy, so there's been, it's, if you look at the press, this idea of vaccine diplomacy of countries competing against each other to not only deliver uh, vaccines, but to, to do it, A, to help the folks there, but also to achieve other objectives, uh, other foreign policy objectives. I guess my question to you is, number one, uh, who, who, are the, who are the actors in that race? Uh, who won, if anyone? Uh, and did it, A, meet some of our global needs with respect to the vaccine, and B, did it help countries meet broader foreign policy objectives? So Kevin, I, I think Dr. Bedelli has already set the stage so that it's clear enough that the international community has not done well. If you were wondering, and you shouldn't be, we have not succeeded. And you use the word failed. Um, there is no good time to throw a pandemic. But it happens that this pandemic struck the world at a time of broad disruption in international relations. By disruption, what I mean is that there was a certain kind of international order that's been building. You've, in your courses, you've heard of it referred to as the liberal international order. It's a series of agreements, of understandings, of institutions. And in the best of circumstances, they don't necessarily work that well. But this pandemic hit at a time when the United States and China were at loggerheads. It hit at a time when um, we were facing other disruptions, economic disruptions, but also migration, also all the impact from climate. All of this, unfortunately, created an environment in which there was not sufficient trust for the institutions that existed to operate effectively. And then, I think, frankly, we were too slow in developing on the, on the run institutions that could be effective. So a really good sign of this is uh, Ebola hit in first November, but really became known in December and then of 2019 and then January of 2020. COVID. Uh, COVID. Although Ebola did also occur in December. <laughs> it must be, must be something about the weather. Uh, COVID. It took until July 1st of 2020 for the UN Security Council to pass a resolution which was utterly toothless. And unlike the reaction to Ebola, the UN Security Council did not identify COVID as a threat to international peace and security. And then there was another resolution in February of uh, 2021, which also had no real teeth. So I think that the answer to this is that instead of having vaccine diplomacy, we went full head on into vaccine nationalism. And the big players were the countries that were able to produce vaccines, and then the countries that had the money to buy vaccines. So the United States, Europe, China, India, Russia, even Cuba got into the, into the game. Um, and given the, the low level of trust, two things happened. One was 
COVAX, and we can talk about COVAX and, and what it did, this consortium to try to buy up vaccines rolled out too slowly because the instrument was not really ready yet. And it could not compete with nation states that locked up the vaccine by early purchases. I brought a little, I brought a little graph with me here, uh, which is a little bit scary. And I'm not sure anyone out there can see it. This is a graph that's relatively early in the process, and that was really important, of who bought how many vaccines per person. Now, you think it's going to be the United States locking up the vaccines, but actually Canada bought nine times the number of vaccines it needed right off the bat. Australia was also high, then Britain, then the United States, European Union, Japan, Nepal, India, Uzbekistan. Countries locked up the vaccines. And then the next step was the competition. And that competition, frankly, I think, was really cynical. Countries started to say they would provide vaccines. And frankly, I think what they were mostly looking for was good press. So China was out front on this. But actually, if you look at the figures, 96% of China's vaccine exports have been for sale, not as donations. And Speaking of disruption, this hit during the Trump administration when we had an administration that was particularly unwilling to cooperate not only with China, but also with international institutions. The, the symbolic crashing error was the decision uh, of the Trump administration to withdraw from the World Health Organization. So the United States stepped back and we weren't present and actively participating in the birth of COVAX to give it the boost it really needed. Now we're in the game and things are beginning to change, but I think I'll stop there so we can get on to the next question. No, that's uh, uh, super clear. Look, actually, I'm I want to add one saying. more force of disruption that, that, you know, why this was timed so badly. For years before COVID hit, there was a growing tendency for the, inter the internet and, and the web to play a huge role in disinformation and misinformation around vaccines. In fact, countries, Russia has actually been identified in studies for a couple of years before the COVID-19 pandemic of uh, deploying bots on social media to basically cause confusion, not anti or pro vaccine, but just cause confusion. So there was this element of international interactions, right, that was now becoming part of this disinformation warfare, which then made the, the vaccine race actually even more complicated because what you saw was internally there was a lot of disinformation and misinformation that led to loss of trust and you know inability of not just uh, communities here in the US, but everywhere around the world being affected by that. But the second part of this is actual competition in whose vaccine is the best. There was an AP study about a, uh, or AP story about a year ago that said Russia was paying Instagram influencers to basically put up like a hundred euros, put up something organic on your feed about why Pfizer doesn't work, right? Specifically targeting who the manufacturer and the exporter was. And this types of interactions actually are not just limited to Russia. A lot of countries actually partook in, in this sort of disinformation warfare um, across the world that affected acceptance, information, and distribution, I think, of many of these vaccines. Do you mind if I jump on Go right ahead. Dr. Bedelia's comments? This is another amazing thing, but what we just heard. And we're experiencing it domestically and internationally. And this has been a big public diplomacy war over vaccine diplomacy. It's gotten very sticky. There's a lot of, what I would say is there are probably five times as many announcements of donations as there are actual donations. I'm not gonna put us in the same boat with um, Russian bots, <laughs> but we announce everything we donate, and China does the same thing. Part of what's gone a little bit haywire on this, I think, is that honestly, people are not that dumb, and they see what's going on, and a lot of countries around the world have said, you know what, you made these promises, you asked us to trot out, and I would say this is more China than the United States, trot out and express our gratitude very publicly, and then you asked for things with strings attached. And this is one of the reasons I think China's efforts have fallen pretty flat, because they connected their uh, vaccine diplomacy explicitly to the ability to conduct certain kinds of trials in countries, sometimes not offering those countries the information about their own people, 
in these trials and then even asking for favors on completely unrelated subjects like the status of Taiwan. So vaccine diplomacy is doing very poorly uh, on this, in part because of this crazy information space. But I, I feel, and I, I really like to, maybe we need to discuss this later yeah. as well, but how much is the truth getting through? And I'm not really sure. Yeah, with all these uh, outlets, it's amazing how difficult it's been to get real information about, uh, about, about all of these trends. To piggyback on one thing on that, uh, one of the, to, so it's not all doom and gloom, I would, would like to know what, what each of your take is on this idea of, what, of a TRIPS waiver. So the World Trade Organization is another one of these global institutions where many developing countries led by uh, South Africa and India said, look, if COVAX can't get going in time, if you aren't going to donate, even though you say you're donating, uh, let us produce this ourselves. But under world intellectual property rules, it's not that easy to take a patent from Moderna and break it, uh, and plus the 35 other patents that it would take to actually pull off a, a, a real set of trials and actually to, to diffuse their technology into, into a community and export it and, and produce it and so forth it is, is not easy, but there are a lot of places that have the capabilities, but they didn't have the legal right to do it. I should say that uh, uh, in our intellectual property rules also make it illegal to share that data with uh, with countries, whether it be China and its bilateral uh, U.S. firms around the world aren't allowed to share that data either. That's just as an as an aside. So uh, the Biden administration uh, did initially support the, the TRIPS waiver, as did some uh, other major advanced economies, but uh, other large. Pharmaceutical producing economies uh, have really pushed back on this, and now here we are, almost too late, or I'll ask you folks, is it almost too late? Uh, but just yesterday, there was a breakthrough, and it seems like, uh, at least for vaccines, we're moving towards a global agreement where countries will be able to break these patents and produce uh, vaccines on their own to distribute to their own people. And I was surprised, in some instances, exported to other countries, which is a little bit of a surprise. What is your thoughts, Ben? How have you tracked this process, and, and what kind of promise might it have for uh, for what I think there's there's two things that have already come out that we haven't said it so clearly. One, the international response hasn't been has been a failure to quote Dr. Bedelia, and two, it's been very uneven, with the poorest countries uh, largely being left to their own, as Dr. Bedelia said. Uh, their their coping mechanism has been infections. Thoughts on that, Dr. Bedelia? <clears throat> So in, in biology, when we look at like procedures or, or you know, uh, mechanisms, what we say is when something is necessary but not you know, sufficient. So the TRIPS waiver is necessary but not sufficient to move forward, not just for this scenario, but I think all the stuff that we do during COVID sets a path right for what happens next. The reason why it's necessary but not sufficient is that in addition to having the permission to create those vaccines, what manufacturers abroad need in many other countries is the tech know-how, it's the recipe. And the companies have not been as forthcoming to share that recipe. You know, there have been efforts to you know, back engineer, um, for, or reverse engineer some of the mRNA technology. I mean, I think we're talking mostly about mRNA technology because it is a powerful tool, and I don't think that most of the general public recognizing recognizes what an incredibly powerful tool it is because it is a plug-and-play technology that can be used in many, many different future emerging infectious diseases threats, but it is also one that's going to change the landscape if we can do it right in terms of endemic diseases, everything from malaria, which by the way, there are mRNA, now mRNA potential efforts being looked at. And so this is a high stakes game for many of these companies who see this as a proprietary technology, which, you know, giving up the, the recipe means, you know, and I, I will step back and say, I clearly support giving up the recipe and allowing the rest of the world not to have millions of people die from endemic infectious diseases. But, but what they see is a big loss and they don't want to share that recipe. So that's one part. The WHO has played a role by setting up mRNA tech transfer hubs. Um, which if the companies will agree to it, there are already hubs set up that will facilitate knowledge sharing around this new technology so that new manufacturers, so um, you know, South Africa and India, and India in particular, has, has done an incredible amount of uh, vaccine production even before COVID. I think like, they, they produce like 60% of the world, the rest of the world's vaccines outside of the US for the resource limited world before COVID. 
Um, and so the ability to be able to create this with the tech know-how would revolutionize the world vaccine you know, scenario. But the, uh, the other things that companies have done, the short of that, you know, so is it enough? The, sh the other things that have done, so the, the, the tech know-how, the, the mRNA tech know-how hubs haven't been, there has, hasn't been as much partnership from Pfizer and from Moderna. And instead, what they have pursued is what they said is finish and fill plants, where they basically send the ready material with the recipe already cooked. And then they're filled up in, in particular areas. And so they're setting up one, I think, in South Africa. Um, no, I'll take that back. Moderna said they're going to set up a plant in Africa, but did not specify where, which country and when it would be. But so they've, they've talked about setting up this finish and fill plant. And Pfizer, I think, has looked um, to do the same somewhere in Latin America as well. But the trouble and the reason why I think it's necessary but not sufficient is because the, the idea, the challenges to getting vaccines um, to the rest of the world are more, also more complicated for the reasons we talked about, this vaccine hesitancy is playing a role, and last mile distribution, their challenges. COVAX wasn't just supposed to buy vaccines, it was supposed to provide the funds to be able to get these. Gotta keep that vaccine in negative, you know, 60 degrees Celsius all the way to the last mile of clinics. They needed to be able to provide that capacity. And in some of the places that I worked in, like electricity is not really reliable. You know, like what I've been, when I have give like just thinking about places in Liberia where they would never be able to try to get, you know, these vaccines to some of the most remote places because there's just no access to reliable power. So how do you how do you sort of get you know this distribution? That requires funding and COVAX has for a long time had a funding gap on those activities. And then vaccine hesitancy, which of course we're all battling. So we need more supplies, but we also need investment in a lot of those other aspects. So I just want to say this is why you should be studying interdisciplinary approaches to global challenges. What you see here with TRIPS and with COVID is that we're seeing an intersection of science, technology, trade, and diplomacy. And it cannot be solved by any one of those pieces alone, despite the remarkable things that are coming uh, from the technology. There is a, a predecessor to this question that was really clear, and this, this happened uh, at the beginning of this century with HIV. And at that time, antiretroviral drugs were incredibly expensive. And countries, especially South Africa, but others, said respecting those intellectual property rights that results in the deaths of many, many people. The United States initially resisted. And we resisted in part because of the strong power of so-called big pharma, those big pharmaceutical companies, their influence in Washington. But remarkably, South Africa and other countries mounted a very effective civil society campaign that ultimately resulted in President Clinton um, saying that the United States would waive our intellectual property rights on some of the aspects of, uh, of the antiretroviral drugs. In the case of COVID, we did not have in place a tripwire that immediately led to steps that should have gotten us a year and a half ago to where we got to yesterday. That's an institutional and diplomatic problem. We should have addressed this somehow earlier. It's not as though we didn't know this was coming. Everyone who studied this knew a big pandemic was coming. Uh, amazingly, I, with, with the class I teach on the subject, I have them watch a movie from uh, 2011, Contagion. In 2011, they predicted almost precisely, and it's a movie, Hollywood, predicted almost precisely what happened in the case of, of COVID. Um, so I think we, we have a really big problem on our hands, and these are political issues. Uh, the president of South Africa referred to this issue as vaccine apartheid. That's the way this is seen. It's seen not only as um, a question of what should be respected in terms of trade and intellectual property from a legal perspective, or even from a diplomatic perspective, but even from a regional and racial perspective. And if you're wondering if it's true, uh, another graph, just in case you haven't had enough graphs, you can all look this up. This is a graph on uh, which we've already heard, Dr. Padilli already referred to these numbers, on, and so did, so did Kevin Gallagher. Um, this shows the level of vaccination amongst high-income and middle-income countries, and this is low-income countries down here. This graph, as you can see, is almost near zero, 
And in many respects, it really was zero, because for the first year and a half, there was essentially negligible vaccination going on in uh, the lowest income countries. So this is a big issue, and we need to deal with it in a systemic way that's going to require us to bring together diplomacy with technology to come up with solutions that can work on the next disease, and there will be a next disease. There will be a next disease, so study hard and prepare for it. I want to pick up on something that Dr. Bedelli talked about, some of the, 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 the underlying institutions that we have. One of the challenges in increasing vaccination has been the decades of underinvestment in health services around the world, especially in poor countries, which by design uh, are, have weaker institutions, as well as improving vaccine access. What are the longer term changes we need to see at the national level to improve resilience to health shocks like this? And I'll ask uh, the ambassador to, to answer the, to, to be the first to answer the second part, which is what changes do we need at the multilateral level uh, to both enable national investments uh, and to be more prepared for events like these? So this is a hotly debated question, and it, there's not a simple answer to it. You've all heard about the last mile, and Dr. Bedelli addressed, addressed that very directly. It is where you actually apply whatever the intervention is to achieve the result. Up until then, you have process, but you have no outcome. So we need to focus on those outcomes. What, what I have found is that there is a kind of almost uh, love affair with technology and theory that distances itself from the realities that you face where you're trying to reach that last mile. I, I worked in, amongst other places, um, in Zambia, and I worked especially on questions of HIV and AIDS, and we had to fight, frankly, with Washington about changing the investments so that we weren't investing as much in antiretroviral drugs, the technological solution, but rather in Zambian health infrastructure. I said, you know what we need? We need nurses. <laughs> We need people who can actually administer these things, uh, people who can do the tests. And the world is aware of this. And from a multilateral perspective, folks have focused on this, but not enough. And a lot of that has to do, frankly, with the funding that goes into these different processes. Um, and that funding almost always comes from the richest countries because they're the ones who have it. As many of you know, uh, WHO's second biggest funder is two people, Bill and Melinda Gates. And incidentally, uh, while they've done wonderful and even beautiful things, I mean extraordinary things, these are people who come from Microsoft. They come from the technology end of, of the human experience. Um, and so I, I, you'll see, in terms of the international reaction, during that lacuna, when we weren't delivering vaccines, we were delivering a lot of reports. There was a blizzard of reports, and they're very good reports. Uh, and uh, again, my poor class, I'm gonna have to read all of them. Uh, but, um, but those reports all do focus on this question as well of, of the health infrastructure that has to be built. Whether or not the investment now follows that analysis is another question. And that's something that's very actively being debated in Geneva right now, and uh, it's going to be debated globally. We can talk about that more later. But well, one good news story, just a two-finger on, on that. Um, Jacob Orr here in Boston University School of Public Health, who's also part of the Global Development Policy Center's uh, Human Capital Initiative, did a study that showed just that, that actually investments in secondary education about HIV prevention and so forth actually have a bigger impact on outcomes than do technological fixes. And it actually led to funding at USAID. They now have a program specifically uh, for HIV education in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that directly came from, from some of his work that, that hammers that point. Um, and so that's a good news. And A, some of these blizzards of studies actually have an impact. Uh, and B, in some cases, they actually learn, uh, lead to funding. Yeah. I. Um... I was gonna just give you an arc of where this discussion of health systems preparedness has gone, right? And I think Ambassador Sterling can give you a much longer arc, but my career at least, right, this conversations about 
how are we beholden to each other as sovereign nations in terms of our responsibilities to everybody else around us when there's a threat within our borders within our doing our trusty business? So now this is a long-standing discussion, right? I mean, it started like, you know, cholera in Europe, there were like conventions about how countries will manage exports and trade restrictions and travel restrictions. And it's gone through the old like 20th century in terms of the creation of the international health regulations, which is a soft law that basically binds uh, signatories to say that now in the current version that they will report, they will surveil, detect, and report threats. So they will surveil, detect, report, and respond to threats within their borders. Um, and interestingly enough, like, you know, like when the first SARS hit, this question of like, okay, what was China's responsibility of telling everybody else that there was a potential novel respiratory virus within their borders? And China got a lot of flack about the delays because by the time they reported that threat, uh, apparently it was in already in many of the capitals, you know, many of the capital countries in China. And, and there was a point that that's too slow to the point where I think there was a, in that spring of that SARS-CoV uh, pandemic, I think SARS, uh, SARS, the original SARS, made it from Asia to North America, back to Asia within 72 hours. The connectivity of our world is such that the, the ability of our neighbors, the ability of our community, global community, respond to threats and this health systems preparedness, all of our destinies are, are tied to that. And so in 2005, you know, there was a whole reset and, and WHO had a revision of the, of the IHR saying that the, they have to, countries have to report within a matter of days if there's a threat within their border. Um, after Ebola, when it seemed obvious, there was a study right before Ebola, West African Ebola epidemic, that said that only 20% of the, of the signatories that signed up for IHR in 2005 actually had the capacity to do that. It takes surveil, detect, respond, and report, right? And so if that's the case, what are the gaps? And so the world set about trying to answer this question again of how do we get all the countries to, you know, to the health systems preparedness that they need to be on. And at that point, um, there was something called the Global Health Security Agenda, this bilateral, multilateral partnership that was put to, sorry, multilateral partnership that was put together to try to um, map out what are the, really in detail, define what are the capacities that are needed. And out of that came the suggestion of creating something called joint external evaluations, where external you know, uh, teams go into countries, help them map out where they are in terms of their capacity. It was meant to be a roadmap for increased funding. It was meant to identify. So why is that? Why is, why is it not the same everywhere? Because of what Kevin um, just said, right? Which is that in many different countries, um, the preparedness is a hodgepodge of whatever project that country ended up getting like, you know, Nigeria is amazing at polio tracing. And in fact, their polio tracing coordination was based on, uh, their Ebola response was based on the investments that were made on polio tracking and tracing, right? So everybody has these like spots of where funders put money. And so the preparedness matrix looks different. And guess what? Now, you know, so there's in the aftermath of that, there was all this discussion about, okay, let's try to figure out what the scores are at each of the different countries, because this is what we do. We try to quantify really complex problems that potentially cannot be quantified, right? Because what they did, the, there was an effort to create something called a JEE score that gives scores to each of the different countries and domains of this preparedness. And um, we apparently did really well in the United States. Number one. Yeah. That should tell you that you know scores can't always reflect you know how countries will respond. And there's a new effort, which I think Kevin mentioned that I'm part of uh, at the WHO level, the Universal Healthcare and Pandemic Review, which is meant to sort of say, look, it's not just capacities. So let's relook at the existing pandemic metrics and health systems metrics. First, you can't look at health systems, you know, pandemic metrics without understanding how viable and living and successful a healthcare system is underlying it. So what are the metrics that we're collecting that can tell us a bit more about the health of those healthcare systems and its ability to take a shock, which is a brand new virus that nobody has immunity against. And the second was that it's not just about capacities, it's actually about the ability, the capability to employ it in a operational way, right? And, and so that's where we failed. We had all the capacities in the world, I think, the United States, where we failed is our about the ability to take those capacities, work in a cooperative manner, and, and be flexible when new threats are available. And I think some of those are the disinformation stuff 
we talked about, the distrust in government, the things that we would not have anticipated when you only look at it from a technocratic perspective or what is needed to handle new threats. We've heard a lot from the three of us. Uh, why don't we take a cluster of questions from you folks, and uh, then we'll ask the, the panelists to, to respond. And again, as I said in the beginning, uh, raise your hand, but tell us, who, tell us who you are so we can uh, have a conversation. Uh, hi, I'm Dante. I'm an undergraduate here in Party studying international relations. Uh, and Master Strell is actually my faculty mentor, so it's very really nice to get to hear him speak. Uh, I had a question about whether or not there is a bigger role that private companies can play in this greater arc of vaccine diplomacy, where, especially here in more liberal democracies, you know, the influence of private companies are something that has a lot of say in the actions taken by our government. So in the experience of COVID-19, have they been sort of elevated to their own entities where now you're seeing countries almost making deals with companies as opposed to other countries? Uh, Dante, that question is really pertinent and it's being debated right now how to deal with it. And in fact, uh, we, we may talk about this a little bit, but there's an effort to produce some kind of international instrument some people are calling it the pandemic treaty, that wants to address the kinds of commitments that we have to one another. And one of the questions is, how do you deal with an international instrument among states when some of the key players are actually pharmaceutical companies? The issue is not entirely new at all. And interestingly, um, the flu, pandemic influenza, uh, which we know of as the common flu, but there's also the potential for pandemic flu, um, that was tackled with a system that's called the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework. And that framework actually created contractual obligations by pharmaceutical companies to the World Health Organization to provide a certain amount of its vaccines when they developed them for pandemic flu in real time, 10% in advance. We didn't have that for COVID. Doesn't mean we can't have it. And so I think we, we are going to have to find a way to bridge this question of obligations of states and obligations of private enterprises, but they have to be brought in somehow. Um, so I do think the answer is absolutely we have to do it. We didn't do it yet. And uh, we're still somewhat, I would say, tripping toward it. This pandemic influenza, pardon me, this pandemic treaty, it took two years and several months. It wasn't until December 1st, um, 2021, that's essentially two years from the outbreak, until the World Health Assembly could agree in a special session to provide a negotiating mandate, not a treaty, a negotiating mandate. And then they gave two and a half more years for that negotiating body to produce a draft. That seems too slow. There ought to be a lot of pressure, I think, on the folks who are dealing with this to do better and to find a way to include obligations for pharmaceutical companies and others. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's one other effort compete, not compete, I'll rephrase that. Uh, the pandemic treaty is, is what it is. And, and I think you and I have spoken, Investor Israel, and I think you are pessimistic about its ability to potentially- Skeptical. Be, skeptical. Um, I hope you're optimistic. I am optimistic, uh, but but I do think it's going to be a long road. And as you said, the time the time horizon needs to be shorter. So there's another effort called um, the Hundred Day Mission. So last spring, Boris Johnson uh, challenged the G7 countries to say, "Look, we got to shape up. We got to do something. We have the resources. We need to have a vision of what we do next time." Out of that, so Patrick Valance, uh, Sir Patrick Valance in the UK was then given the charge to help design this. That brought together advisors, science advisors, and others uh, across the world, and, co and co countries, governments, as well as private industries into a conversation of what we do next time. So it, it came together into something called the mission statement for the 100-day mission, which basically means to provide uh, diagnostics, vaccines, and treatments, DVTs. It's a whole other, DVTs is a, in medical lingo, DVTs means like blood clots. So I have to like be careful when I, when I say this. So, but, but DVTs, they're, they were meant to provide, the ability to provide within the first 100 days of a new threat, DVTs to, that are available, safe, 
their proven efficacy, right? So what's the challenge? How do we get there? And so if you guys are interested, I would read that because I think in some ways it's helping define the charge. There was an implementation report that came out in December after the initial mission statement last summer that lays out a roadmap of how G7 countries are thinking about this employment. And in that, and the towards the end of it, so they cover, you know, just how we get to these vaccines, diagnostics, and treatment, but the, at the end they have enabling mechanisms, and one of them is a call to governments that when they negotiate with com companies about these DBTs, that they, in that language, negotiate the ability of LMICs to be able to get percentage. So it's, it's in the contracts when the money is given to companies at the beginning of pandemics, which we didn't do, which is one of the issues here that we're facing. Um, and so we'll see if that goes anywhere. The, the other thing that the report is really great for is that it really lays out um, private industry alliances, like the Intrepid Alliance is part of the big group of companies, pharmaceutical companies that are working on antiviral drugs. So it shows that there is active thinking about how to engage that with industry partners into development of this 100-day mission, if you will. Could, could I say that, that uh, what Dr. Padilli just described about the 100-day mission, to me, is a sign of partly why I'm pessimistic about the treaty, <laughs> but why I'm not pessimistic altogether. We really need not to crowd out individual efforts, coalitions of the willing, coalitions of the able, with some central treaty that would take up all the oxygen. I don't think that's going to happen. And the 100 day mission is a really good example of something that's going on in parallel. To me, that's absolutely essential because we're not going to be able to get in the halls of Geneva um, a broad agreement on a lot of the things that absolutely have to be done. But the G7, maybe it can do it. Maybe the G20 can do it. Maybe other groups can do yeah. it. More comments, more questions. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Sanetti. I'm a, also an undergraduate major, majoring in international relations. And now I'm actually minoring in public health. Um, and I have Professor Sterella uh, in another class. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I guess I'll just ask one. Um, what do you think? Uh, we, we saw the graph of higher income countries and the vaccination rates in the lower income countries. Um, and earlier on, how the AU, um, the African Union, responded um, to, to the COVID crisis, how they kind of needed uh, a bit more help from higher income countries. So what do you think, now that we're, at least in America, kind of getting towards the end of the restrictive policy of COVID, what do you think Western countries or just higher income countries can do to help lower income countries um, today or in the future to help um, combat, I guess? Um, we talked about investing in healthcare, but do you think that could be in place now or other measures that um, higher income countries can put in place to help um, lower income? Yeah, I'm going to start by saying the pandemic is not over, even though we don't have our masks on right now. <laughs> um, I am going to say that the, my experience with epidemics and outbreaks and pandemics in the past has been that even when they are over, there's a very long tail of recovery. IMF had a study two years ago that showed in the five years in the aftermath of most epidemics, the income inequality in countries goes up. The Gini coefficient, right? You guys are familiar with that, which measures income inequality within countries. And beyond that, the devastation. So what what can you know what can rich countries do now? I think first and foremost, we need to, for our common destiny, increase global surveillance for new variants because that poses a threat to our ability to, with all these vaccines in hand, to get back to normal. And there is work on that. There is, uh, there is the WHO has a bio surveillance hub that's been created in Berlin. Uh, there is, you know, efforts to try to build up surveillance globally, but what's happening is, you know, just inching back into the diplomacy field when countries actually find a variant. Look at what happened to South Africa. They shared that they had discovered a new variant and they were punished with, you know, travel and trade restrictions rather than be commended for getting their capacities up and running to be able to identify them. Um, so one is that surveillance. Two is the continued effort to try to get the most of the world vaccinated. Um, we are on our, Pfizer just submitted a request for a second booster for those over 65. So there are portions of the rich world that will have gotten four doses, where most of the rest of the world has barely gotten one. Um, 
So we are increasing, we're continuing to see this and to bridge that, the demand for the actual quantity of vaccines, as well as all those mechanisms that allows us to get the vaccines to where they need to be is going to be important. Better or for worse, one good thing is that what we know about immunity with, that, with the vaccines as well as infections is that although our protection against infection is likely to go down, in people who are under 65, there is likely still, for a long period of time, persistence of protections against severe disease or hospitalizations. That means that if you got your three boosters, you know, you might still get an infection as your antibodies go down, but your, the rest of your immune system is gonna protect you against more severe things. That means that everybody, now that we've increased the global amount of immunity, hopefully the impact is not as much. But what's the wild card? The wild card is that variant. Um, which we want to sort of protect against. And, and that's, that's one of the things that we can do. The second is to help resource limited countries with that long tail of recovery. Um, WHO had a report, I believe it was WHO, last fall, that by that point, the numbers from the summer said that over 115,000 healthcare workers had died globally um, from COVID-19. And think about communities that are strapped for healthcare workers to begin with, right? And when you talk about the healthcare workers going to leave <laughs> not just because, not just they died of it, but they're leaving the field here in the U.S. and elsewhere. And the attrition is really going to be damaging for the rest of the indicators. Immunization rates have gone down. Childhood immunization rates for other endemic diseases have gone down by about 20% looking at some reports. But tracing for tuberculosis and HIV and diagnostics have gone down. You know, people aren't getting tested as much for HIV and tuberculosis. That means those rates will go up again. And that's just the field of infectious diseases. We're not even talking about impact on childhood education, women's empowerment, early marriage, you know, of, of young girls who are now out of schools who are being pushed into child marriages. We're talking domino impact on economies because they had to shut down because it's a new variant and there was a surge. This is, this is the tip. This is just the first challenge. The waves of this pandemic continue well after the infection rates go down. I'll just add that it's important to keep the conversation a global one, right? The, the, way, the sort of way you framed it that we're starting to feel around here like, oh, we're, we're back to some kind of normal, but it is, it is still raging. It's really important in democratic societies to keep these issues salient and, and global. Just so uh, at the G7 last year, the United States pledged $30 billion to create a what's called a Resilience and Sustainability Trust at the International Monetary Fund, which would help countries react to pandemics and climate change. Uh, last Thursday, the bill that uh, was going to allocate funding for that cut the funding for that out. After the G7, we went to Glasgow to talk about climate change, and we pledged a huge amount of money for something called the Green, the, the Green Climate Fund. Last week's bill also doesn't have that in there. and so. That it was salient at the time, like, like Ambassador said, we make a lot of these pledges and promises, but then when especially the strongest ones have money behind them, we really have to keep these issues global and keep them salient because our leaders might feel like, oh, well, there's something else to be focused on, like a war and, uh, a war, uh, and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's for those of you who are party students and, and here at BU, we have to remember that we, we might be in a place that's start, turning a corner for now. Uh, but we live in a world that uh, has had a highly unequal distribution of this and there's still chronic needs and it, they go far beyond just making sure that someone's going to get this virus. It trickles into generational change uh, through some of the things like uh, early, early marriage and childbirth, etc. More questions or comments? Hi, um, I'm, I'm Rachel Crasher. I work uh, with Kevin at Global Development Policy Center. Um, and I, um, I think the word vaccine diplomacy for me means sort of um, we get something in return for, for giving you something. And so I, you, know, you have talked about some examples of that in which um, there were some perhaps troubling strings attached or, or promises that were not kept. Um, so uh, I guess my first question would be, have there been, have any of these efforts of, at vaccine diplomacy, good and bad, had any impact on balances of power, political power, um, uh, or relationships that you've seen? Um, and second, is there a positive vision for this vaccine diplomacy, um, a, a way forward? What would it look like if it was well done? Before you catch that, I know we're running out of time a little bit, and you had your hand up, so why don't we just get both of them up here, and you folks can make some 
some closing remarks. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Kiara. I'm an undergraduate studying IR in public health and a student of Professor Sorales. Uh, I'd ask Dr. Daly, you mentioned that country, like low resource in developing countries, generally their health programs target issues that have received funding on a particular topic. What is there an effort to kind of universe, universally boost the health capacity in these countries that aren't specific to a particular issue? And also, is there an effort to address um, surrounding like, social and cultural issues like child marriage that may not directly be health issues, but definitely have implications on community health? I'll let you take the first one, and I'll take the second. Mm. Uh, so let me start, Rachel, by saying that um, there's a phrase out there that we need to examine, which very much focuses on this intersection of science and policy. And that is, no one's safe until everyone's safe. First, this creates, this thought creates the fundamental basis for the kind of trade-off that you were speaking of. And Dr. Bedelli has talked about the importance of surveillance. Surveillance means having sentinel systems out there. It means having somebody in the DRC who has the ability to detect something and report it in a timely way. I hate to put it in such base terms, but that creates something to trade. Because we are not going to have those surveillance systems where we need them, which is not in the United States, although we need them here too, unless we invest. And frankly, I think sovereign countries should be in a position to say, we want something for you to have access to, to us and to be part of the system. The problem with this is that it's not the technology in a way it may be changing all of this. It may be that somebody with a suitcase just traveling in DRC can take a swab and report the DNA back to CDC without involving anyone from the DRC. Um, so I think that that causes we have to see how this develops. What I think has happened that we've seen is that the world community has not felt that we're not safe, we're not all safe until everyone's safe. That is not the way we've acted. And I would add that there's some things that are grotesque. Um, amongst people working in the pharmaceutical industry, it's been reported, I don't know if it's accurate exactly, that nine new billionaires were minted through this, through this pandemic. And the pandemic has been wonderful for rich people and terrible for poor people. Billionaires have seen their incomes or their, their, rent, not their, their assets go up in value by over 60% during the pandemic. There's this, there's this, there is, to me, a palpable injustice in all of this. And I hope that that will trade, will push uh, the desire for people to see their interests more broadly in the interests of others. I'll close with just one optimistic note on all of this. And that is, there is a precedent that's extraordinary, and that was the eradication of smallpox. That took place at the height of the Cold War, at a time when the United States and the Soviet Union were absolutely at loggerheads. And the initiative to get that done actually started with the Soviet Union. And there was cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States. And we talked about the last mile. There's some incredible kinds of videos you can watch about this, where there were hundreds of millions of visits to people in India to provide the vaccine to create the possibility for eradic eradication. And in 1980, 1980, it worked. If we could do it then, maybe we can find the basis of doing it now. Yeah, and then to your question, I, I think that this has sort of been a long standing struggle in global health development right, and economic development, which is that countries, uh, resource in their countries depend on external funding, and sometimes for very essential services. And there has been, the conflict here is that then, you know, what you see is donors uh, projecting requirements for a certain amount of funding of this is how you do it, this is how you don't do it. And, and that's a long, long recognized issue. And actually, it was being worked on, it's been worked on for decades. For example, in infectious diseases, there's been effort from WHO international community to work on IIS, integrated disease surveillance systems, I, response systems, so IIDRS, which is basically, I have a perfect example for this. 
this is, I was in, I was in a university lab in Nigeria, and I was talking to one of my colleagues, and, and he said, this is the PCR machine we do HIV on, this is the PCR machine we do TB on. I was like, okay, why are they in like two different parts of the room? They're like, this is from this funder, this is from that funder. Oh, and neither one of them can be used for other endemic right. diseases. Right? That's a perfect example of how there's like vertical lines of funding. They're supporting certain programs, and with them come the capacity, and they're separated. And there's been a long standing effort to, in with that IDRS, to try to integrate surveillance, infectious diseases surveillance that's like more at country level. Um, so, but, but it goes to this idea that it's more complicated because it goes to the, the governance. You know, and this is ventures more into you guys' field than mine, but this idea of governance of, of countries deciding right how much of their budget goes to what it's the external influence of the external funding itself but then all internally the priorities of countries and there have been there's good good conversations about this and there's bad conversations about this the good conversations about this is how do you support positive investments in health sector and other things in countries that maybe don't have the best governance the bad about this is how you that that same effort and venture into telling other countries what to do against the, the benefits of their own citizens, right? So how do you balance that? In the newest version, so the bad things about this was, I think in 1990s, right, structural adjustment programs was uh, the World Bank and others sort of imposing requirements. Remember that, that long time ago in terms of adjust, providing requirements for countries to re reshape their economies and that had negative impacts with the fallouts. But there could be new, like you know, uh, priorities or new efforts or tools. And one of them in the G7, for example, the 100-day mission that they're thinking about is using IMF. When IMF meets with countries, they have something called Article Four consultation, where they basically the economists go in and they talk to their countries, the relative countries that they're loaning to about their fiscal health and 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 you know economic sort of plans. One of the things that's proposed is that part of what IMF does is that it integrates pandemic requirements of pandemic preparedness health metrics in, in their economic evaluation. How much are you investing in this? So that could be one way in, in how we both you know provide more funding, potentially the right restrictions, but then have other levers in which we which we help uh, countries shape their investment in those sectors. Not enough of it is multidisciplinary, as you said, um, still. And the UHVR effort that I mentioned before with WHO, one of the things that it's trying to do is not just look at health indicators. It's also looking at you know things that you talked about, which is uh, education and, and women's empowerment as some of the indicators of, of societal, just general public health you know, um, uh, responsiveness, if you will. Well, it's been great to go beyond the headlines with all of you, even though some of these issues are starting to disappear from the headlines. Uh, please go to the party webpage, uh, follow the party school on Facebook to find out more about these events. Uh, and while I have you here, I'll, I'll plug one. Uh, uh, Ambassador Sterella said it's, it's important to be interdisciplinary and to be policy oriented uh, uh, from a generous gift from uh, being alumni uh, with the economics department, the GDP Center set up something called the Paul Street Lecture and we're now in our third year, it goes to an economist who's made advances in economic theory and thinking, but who's also made major advancements in, uh, in, in, in actual policy in the lives of different people. The first year we had uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the former Nobel Prize winner. Last year, uh, unfortunately virtual, we had a woman named Ann Harrison, a uh, long time, uh, she's now the dean of the business school at the University of uh, California, Berkeley, but a uh, long time world bank person. And next Wednesday, a live event at the Trustees Ballroom at 4 p.m. March 23rd uh, of Danny Robert from uh, from Harvard University. There'll be reception afterwards, so we can be in person and we can have reception. Please help me in thanking Dr. Bredelia and Ambassador Sterloff for this engaging conversation.